much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. <clears throat> Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have the opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? <laughs> yes, dear, if you can believe him. Oh, I don't. But that doesn't affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. <laughs> Mr. Wadi, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have the opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? <laughs> I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to cross them. This is not the moment for German scepticism. <laughs> Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief has said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. So you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no, true. I have forgotten. <laughs> there are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Couldn't we both speak at the same time? Excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. <laughs> <laughs> Will you take this time from me? Certainly. Mm. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> Our Christian names? Is that all? But we're going to be christened this afternoon. For my sake, you're prepared to do this terrible thing? I am. To please me, you are willing to face this fearful ordeal. I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. When questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling. Wait, darling. Qu'est-ce que cela signifie? Tout simplement que je veux me marier avec Mr. Worthing, maman. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weakness in the old. <laughs> daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. <laughs> her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of a permanent income on thought. <laughs> I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any question. <laughs> I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on my all points, I am firm. But I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. <laughs> and now, as regard Adjanon. Adjanon. <laughs> oh, Aunt Augusta. <laughs> May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Uh, no, no, no. Um, Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. <laughs> oh, I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. <laughs> what did he die of? Oh, Bunbury. He was quite <coughs> exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? <laughs> I wasn't aware Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean, he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. So that's what I mean. So Bunbury died. He seems to 
have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. <laughs> I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted on the proper medical advice. <laughs> And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bombery, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who's that young person whose hand my nephew are John on, is now holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner. <laughs> Lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I'm engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. Mm. I do not know if there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, <laughs> but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. <laughs> I think some preliminary inquiry from my part would not be out of place. <sighs> Mr. Worthing, <laughs> is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> <laughs> I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporum, Fifeshire, NB. That does not sound unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. <laughs> <laughs> but what proof have I of their authenticity? I have carefully preserved the court guides of the period. They're open to your inspection, Lady Bracken. <laughs> I've known some strange errors in that publication. <laughs> Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Mark B, Mark B and Mark B. <laughs> Mark B, Mark B and Mark B. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told one of the Mr. Marbys is occasionally to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. How extremely kind of you, Lady Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I also have in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation and measles. Both the German and English variety. <laughs> ah, a lie crowded with incident, I see. Though... Perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune? Uh, about £130,000 in the funds. That's all goodbye, Lady Bracken. £130,000! And in the funds! <laughs> Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. <laughs> Few girls of the present day have any really solid qualities. Any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear! <laughs> <laughs> Pretty child! Your dress is sadly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. <laughs> but we can soon alter all that. A thoroughly experienced French maid produces a really marvellous effort in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. <laughs> and after six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly turn round. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> the side view is what I want. 
Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. A too weak point in our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. That chin, a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. <laughs> Add your name. Yes, Aunt Augusta. There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world, and I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully about society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs> <laughs> Dear child, of course you know Algernon has nothing but his debt to depend upon, but I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. <gasps> Cecily, you may kiss me. Uh, thank you, uh, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank, Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding each other's character out before marriage, which I think is never advisable. <laughs> For interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Adjanon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. Uh. What more can one desire? Well, it pains me very much to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is, I do not approve of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew, a German. Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained admission to my house by means of the false pretense of being my brother. Under an assumed name, he drank... <laughs> I've just been informed by my butler, an entire pint bottle of Perrier Jouet Brew 89. Why uh. I was specially reserving for myself. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stated he and devoured every single muffin. <laughs> and what makes his conduct all the more heartless is he was perfectly aware from the first that I have no brother, that I never had a brother, and that I do not intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I distinctly told him so myself yesterday afternoon. Oh, Mr. Worthing, after <laughs> careful consideration, I have decided to entirely overlook my nephew's conduct to you. That is very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. <laughs> my own decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to being 20 at evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alterations. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. <laughs> looks so calculated. <laughs> 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it won't be long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. I beg your pardon for interrupting you again, Lady Bracknell, but according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age 
until she is 35. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem to me to be a great objection. 35 is a very attractive age. <laughs> London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained 35 for years. <laughs> Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. <laughs> I see no reason why our dear Ceci should not be even still more attractive at the age that you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Yeah, Algie, <laughs> could you wait until I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt that instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, but I like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is out of the question. Well, what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr Worthing, as Miss Cecily positively states that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature. <laughs> I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But, my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. For the moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow my, allow my nephew to form an alliance <laughs> with your war. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all any of us can look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. <laughs> Come, dear. We have missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. <laughs> uh, everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christening, sir! Isn't that somewhat premature? <laughs> <laughs> Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? <laughs> the idea is grotesque and irreligious. I do not forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. <laughs> Am I to understand it? That there ought to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. Mm -hmm. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They say that of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. <laughs> However, as your present mood seems to run peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. <laughs> Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I'm on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism? A female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask which position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell has for the last three years been Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expect to be in the vestry, dear Cannon. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. <laughs> Prism! <laughs> Come here, Prism! <laughs> <laughs> in charge of a perambulator. 
that contain the baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigation of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. <laughs> <laughs> it contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. <laughs> but the baby was not there. <laughs> Prism, where is that baby? Oh, Lady Brecknell, I admit with shame I do not know. I only wish I did. Well, the plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. Well, in a moment of mental abstraction for which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and I placed the baby in the handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. Which railway station? Victoria. The Brighton line. <laughs> <laughs> I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, yeah. wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. <laughs> what means, Lady I dare not even suspect Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. <laughs> Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument with the furniture. A dislike <laughs> argument of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. <laughs> <laughs> it has stopped now. I wish it would arrive at some conclusion. The suspense is terrible. <laughs> I hope it will last. <laughs> <laughs> this is a handbag, Miss Prism. Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. Well, it seems to be mine. Well, well yes. Here's the injury it received, the upsetting the Gower Street omnibus. Younger and happier days. <laughs> Stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. Oh, and here on the locker, my initials. I had quite forgotten that in a moment of extravagance I've had them placed there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it restored to me so unexpectedly. It's been quite some inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the child you left in it. You? Yes. <laughs> Mother! Mr. Worthing, I'm married. <laughs> unmarried. I cannot deny that's a serious blow. <laughs> <laughs> But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Well, why should there be one rule for men and uh, another for women? Mother, I forgive you. Mr. Worthing, Mr. Worthing, there has been some error. There is a lady who can tell you who you really are. What would you Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you mind telling me who I am? I am afraid the news I have to give you might not altogether please. <laughs> <laughs> you are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, a German Zelda brother. <laughs> How is she's elder brother? And I have a brother after all. Oh, he said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? <laughs> Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> <laughs>
My unfortunate brother, you, young scoundrel, LD, you have to behave to me not more like a brother in the future, eh? Never behave to me like a brother in all your life! Well, not till today, dear boy, I admit. I did try my best, however. Oh, I was out of practice. My own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name, now that you've become someone else? I'd quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is quite irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except my affections. <laughs> noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the matter had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta, a moment. Yeah. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been <laughs> lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I had been christened, that's settled. That. <laughs> <laughs> what was my Christian name? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what's my father's Christian name? <laughs> I cannot recall at the present moment what the Christian name was. But I have no doubt he had one. It was a trick, I admit, but only in later years. And that was rather the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. Al G, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. Died before I was a year old. His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. <laughs> but I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. His delightful record should have been my constant study. <laughs> N. Generals Malum, Maxborn, Magley. What ghastly names they have. <laughs> <laughs> Marksby, Mixby, Moncrief. Lieutenant 1900, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General 1915. Christian names. <laughs> Ernest John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always told you, didn't I, Gwendolyn, that, that my name was Ernest? Well, my name is Ernest after all. I, I mean, it naturally is Ernest. Yes! I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. <laughs> Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all of his life he's been speaking Nothing but the truth. <laughs> can you forgive me? I can, for I feel you, uh, you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia! Frederick, at last! Cecily, at last! <laughs> My nephew, you seem to be displaying some signs of triviality. <laughs> Quite the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I've now realised, for the first time in my life, the vital importance of being honest. <laughs> <laughs>